I'm sure all of you know who Patrick Weitzel is, but he's executive chair of Endeavor, which is a parent company. I'm going to ask you to explain exactly that okay. structure in a minute. But um, for those of you who don't appreciate what Endeavor is, uh, it is a remarkable force of nature in Hollywood. And back in the days when I dealt a lot with entertainment, it, they were talent agents like CAA, yep. William Morris, and things like that. <clears throat> They've gone way past that now. I mean, these are, these are conglomerates in a sense, really powerful institutions. And this is the executive chairman, so we're really pleased to have you here. I personally am pleased to just be able to talk to you. It's really well, great. I'm thrilled to be here and obviously share a lot of back, uh, common experiences with people here in the room. So it's a real privilege and hopefully it'll be interesting what we talk about. So, so set the stage for us for a second. <clears throat> Explain the structure of Endeavor, because you have Endeavor and you have IMG and you have mm -hmm. WME. How's it structured overall? So I should probably just take you through it because it's been a uh, kind of journey to get here. Um, as David said at the beginning, <clears throat> we start out as a talent agency. So those of you not familiar with what that is in, in the entertainment business, basically representing actors, directors, writers, musicians, authors, and putting together films, television shows, selling books, et cetera. Uh, and in about 2008, our agency was called Endeavor, and we saw at that time a lot of the trends and a lot of the things that are now kind of apparent in our business were happening. Uh, predominantly uh, the disintermediation of the big distribution companies, the commoditizing of distribution, and then the kind of the explosion of content was all in front of us. And so what we saw was a unique opportunity from where we sat to actually take a talent agency which would be incredibly strategic in a much bigger company, but build out really a media company. And so the first step of that was in 2009, we took Endeavor and we merged it with the William Morris Agency um, to kind of build out a very kind of what we thought dominant and powerful position in the entertainment space. And uh, that went, went incredibly well. And then the next step was we saw that sports and fashion were the next logical place for us to go which led to around 2014, we acquired IMG. And then that obviously gave us kind of a gigantic kind of global footprint in entertainment, sports, and fashion. Uh, along the way, we have uh, acquired about 25 other companies, um, ranging from things that were core to that business of representation, whether it's Dixon Talent Group or the Wall Group, uh, and obviously more recently, things like the UFC and Pro Bowl writing. Uh, so now that kind of leads us to about, a, I think last October, we had a bunch of these different companies, but to make it a little bit less confusing, we introduced Endeavor as the whole co, in which all these kind of labels and businesses fall underneath to make it a little bit more understandable. Uh, and so that's kind of where we got to. It's been a rapid growth. We have added about, since 2009, 6,000 employees. Hmm. Um, we went from, essentially two offices to we have 200 offices in 20 countries around the world. So that's been a real, real rapid kind of expansion and growth curve for us. Um, but it, fortunately, it's gone really well. We've had a lot of great people and a lot of help along the way. Uh, but that's kind of how we, where we went from kind of 2009 to who we are today. So there, there are a lot of aspects of what you do that are really unique to your industry. But talk about some that are more common to people, things people would know in this room. If you take a company that adds that many new companies, there's a problem with integration. I mean, yeah. bringing all those people under one umbrella, making sure you're all rowing in the same direction as it were. How did you address that? What did you learn from that process? And to what extent did you allow people just to keep running their operations? So uh, that was, well, they were a little bit different for each, each stage of it. The, the Endeavor William Morris part was probably the easiest because it was a merger of a business that we knew very well and knew how to run. And it was really more just about integrating people who had, who we were used to working with, understood what they did, and just kind of created, created a great culture uh, for them to thrive and be successful in. IMG was slightly different in the sense that it was a um, lot of common uh, uh, characteristics, but it was sports and fashion, and it was global, and it was spread out around, around the, the globe. And also, the way it was structured as a company intentionally um, by Teddy Forsman when he owned it was, he ran it very siloed. You know, he'd like, he'd like, like to look at us from a private equity perspective. This is our fashion footprint. This is, this is media. This is college. Um, you know, this is golf, tennis, et cetera. And he ran it that way. Where we saw the real value was the synergies across all those areas and kind of the network effect. And if you could approach it the way we approach agenting, which was, you know, getting multiple parties around the table kind of for the greater good, 
you could do really well. So that was a, a challenge in essentially bringing down a lot of those uh, barriers. About 5,000 of those employees, or about 4,500 of those employees, came in the IMGA acquisition. So that was the challenge of that, and then integrating that with, uh, with WME in the areas that made sense. Um, the follow-on acquisitions were either things that, like I said earlier, fit those core businesses and kind of bolstered our organic growth and our, our, our capabilities, or were things that we thought, given our unique kind of footprint and, and I guess, assets and talents, businesses that we could turbocharge and make a real dramatic difference, which is why we did the UFC, why we did PBR, why we did uh, Miss Universe, and a host of others, because we thought our company could uniquely grow them faster than someone else. And, and how do you get information from all those different operations? I mean, how do you keep track? Because it gets geometrically more difficult as a manager to know what's going on in these different businesses all around the world, as you say. Yeah, I think that's a, uh, I mean, that is always the challenge. I mean, but I think for us is that when you grow up in the entertainment business, you know, knowledge and, uh, and disseminating knowledge is power, you know, about what's going on because there's constantly deadlines that are really around films or television projects or festivals being put together that you have to get that information out ASAP to your group and have a coordinated way of doing it. So we were really, I think, good at that. We came into it. Obviously, it became larger and bigger, but in some ways, the, the speed and rapidity of those businesses and those decisions were slower. So when you looked at our tennis business or our golf business, there was a 12-month calendar. You saw things coming up. It was less transactionally mm -hmm. oriented. So I think we had some advantages around that. So th those are aspects that are common to a lot of different businesses, people are familiar with. Tell us about what's really different about your business. I mean, each business is different, but yours is particularly different. Yeah, I think the, uh, the thing that I think is great about our business, but also very challenging and uh, I, I do think unique is, you know, you have financial goals and objectives for the company and for your clients. But, and in most businesses, those would probably be enough to make the right decisions and, and to have success. But we really deal with creative people um, and artists in some ways, whether that's an athlete or an actor or a writer, however you want to describe it. And so what also comes into their thinking is not only what is the best financial outcome, but what is the right thing for me creatively? What do I want to say with what I'm doing? What do I want my work to be about in the marketplace? And none of that has nothing to do with uh, uh, the financial goals. And so you're constantly balancing that part and you're trying to guide that and nurture that. And I would say that that's the same for someone who we represent who may be an actor, but also that would be the same thing for an entity like Wimbledon, which is has obviously a worldwide brand um, and, and puts on an incredible event around tennis every year. But how they do it and what they do and the financial decisions they make, the, the partners that they bring in as sponsorship are all carefully calculated because they have a pristine brand. They want Wimbledon to mean something around the world and that guides them. That's a, that's a creative decision. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's the one thing that's unique about our business, but I also think it's what makes our business incredibly fun, incredibly dynamic, uh, and also incredibly interesting because of the people you come across who, you know, who travel in those, in those worlds and are trying to do that with their careers. You grew up professionally as an agent. Correct. So you know that aspect of the business really well. You do it really well or you wouldn't have the job you have right now. How do you find other people? Because you've got a lot of other people now who are responsible for doing what you just described. How do you make sure that they're the right people to do that and that they're doing the job well? Because you can't manage every one of those relationships personally. Yeah. Well, I think on the, uh, <clears throat> on the kind of WME part of our business, which is kind of what you're talking about, is there is a very, very sophisticated kind of well-honed training program. I mean, I would say majority of the agents that we have started with us from the very beginning. Uh, you've heard about the stories of the mailroom and, uh, you know, kind of working your way up. That's where I started. That's where uh, my uh, partner Ari started. We started at the bottom. We literally were the assistant and then became a baby agent, et cetera. And in that process, you are able to kind of like really mold the people in the way you want them to, uh, to behave. You help them kind of grow their talents. And then, of course, there's other people that have joined you from other people, other other organizations or you know they've hired from the outside but that kind of basic idea about how we approach it our philosophy because every agency is different um, is kind of embedded in them 
kind of early on. Uh, so I think that's kind of how we've, how I think we've had the success of it. And again, the confidence, I think the biggest thing was we were okay uh, with failure and we were okay with our you know, younger people mm -hmm. failing and failing big. And actually we kind of always push for that. Like if you're not failing and you're not you know, making mistakes, you're probably not trying hard enough and pushing hard enough. So we were comfortable with that and betting on our people. Uh, and that was the only way we thought we could grow it. You said you're a media company, mm -hmm. uh, and I mean, almost every business is going through a lot of transformation. Disruption is the overused word, but media is right up at the top of the list. I mean, even today with the Disney new offer yeah. for most of the 21st <clears throat> Century Fox uh, assets, how is that disruption affecting your business? How can you adjust to that? Because the distribution chains that you yep. would have been negotiating with five years ago are not what they were. Even if they still exist, they still don't have the same power. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. And <clears throat> we are living that every day. I think, first of all, we are in a, um, uh, an abundance of content is being created uh, at record prolific levels. You know, there's, I think, 9,000 hours of, of scripted drama produced and released in the, in the uh, world last year. Um, so there is uh, incredible demand for pre what we call premium content. Uh, the first impact for us has been, obviously, it's been a boon for our clients. And clients uh, who are creating these sh shows are having unprecedented success. I'll just give you a few examples. It used to be like when you're ABC or some cable, if you had a, a, a creator of a show, if he had two shows, maybe three shows on the air, that was a lot yeah. and kind of incredible. Well, we have a guy named Greg Berlanti. He has 16 scripted mm -hmm. shows on the air right now, uh, which is, or sorry, 14 shows. Uh, Dick Wolf has 16 scripted, non-scripted shows across uh, broadcast cable and streaming services. Amlin, which is Steven Spielberg's company, has 14 shows. So the list of this goes on and on. We at WME oversee, we put together 400 shows across broadcast and cable. And on the streaming services, 75% of, of Amazon's scripted content we have put together. 50% of Netflix new shows we put together. So that has been an incredible uh, growth period. The challenge is what's come with that is, so now your first job is you, got to, you have to look at all of these different outlets of, of distribution and figure out what's the right home mm -hmm. for that show or that idea or that documentary, whatever it would be. And in our first job is to guide our clients through that kind of process. Uh, and inside of that, there's a, there's a discovery issue. You know, I mentioned Netflix, who's obviously been this incredibly successful company and have, have, has, is, is, has unbelievable content on it. But they, had, they, they launched in 2017 300 shows. Or, and that would be from recurring shows that came back, like a Peaky Blinders or something like that, or a new show, and documentaries and stand-up specials, but 300 of them. What they did was they were able to um, launch a 100 national campaign. So when you would say you're going to promote a new show, 100 of them they actually were able to present or to uh, promote, excuse me, from LA to New York and everywhere in between, which is pretty remarkable. That's two a week, which is incredibly hard to do, as you know <laughs> uh, from experience. But that still leaves 200 shows that didn't have that type of, of, of exposure. And so one of the things that I talked about earlier is you know, artists want to make their work, but they want people to see it. And so part of the challenge is now is like, okay, how do we help people cut through that and make sure it gets seen? And in this world of like endless choices. And uh, I think the second piece of what happened for us is that it led us to creating uh, Endeavor content. And Endeavor content is basically a resource for clients at the earliest stages of putting a show or a movie together to go and get the resources to develop it, to maybe finance it, to maybe package it, because the further along you can put a project together, the more options you have as far as where you take it, the more creative control you can have, the more financial upside. So a direct response to kind of these changes in the marketplace was creating this, uh, this outlet for people. And if you watch television, Killing Eve, we just kind of started this in the last year, but Killing Eve, which is a very successful at BBC, came out of that, the book club, was the movie was out like six weeks ago, a direct you know kind of like result of this. So that's been a very that's one of the answers that we've had to it because in, inside your question is a, is another thing is that when you are 
negotiated a deal for a television show with a cable network or a traditional broadcast network, now the things are fundamentally different when you're talking about a movie or television show on a streaming service. There, you know, the, the, the budget, the transparency around who saw it, how well it did, the back end is either bought out or gone from the clients. So they have no real, maybe either, either participation or any insight to what that's happening. It, you don't know exactly when maybe it's going to be released, how it's going to be marketed. So you have a fundamentally different negotiations going on. And our job is to kind of try to like help clients understand the difference of the two and also be proficient in, in negotiating both of those type of deals. Because you still are making the deals with CBS and ABC and HBO. Those are still obviously a, a big part of our business. But there is now a completely different buyer who is less hit driven and more about subscriber driven. And so it becomes much more portfolio strategy for Netflix than it does about one hit show or hit movie. So as I listen to all this and you hear this explosion in content, I mean, the numbers you recite are unfathomable to me. I mean, back in the old ABC days, we couldn't have conceived of that. Right. We had a few gatekeepers. We amassed a lot of money from advertisers, basically. And we paid a fair amount of money you know, per episode and Correct. gave back end, by the way. Uh, there's not more money to go around, is there? I mean, where does that money come from when you have thousands of programs being started? Where does the money come from? To pay well, the for money it? is actually, I think that that actually, I don't think is going to end anytime soon because <clears throat> what would happen before, and the kind of logic you're applying is that if, even if you were, so broadcast television, as you guys all know, you would go sell advertising and now you get carriage fees, but you had certain right. types of revenue that came around ratings predominantly. And that drove a certain amount of money that you made programming with. So there was a direct relationship between that, and you had to like basically produce programming cheaper than what you were selling the, the advertising for. Uh, even cable subscriptions were slightly different. Yes, they were still adding subscribers, but they were actually, there was X amount of money they were going to make from subscriptions. They used that to create content that hopefully had you coming back, but they still had to show a profit. Now, the, the bet for Netflix particularly has been, as you guys probably know, is adding subscribers. And investors in Wall Street don't care if they're making money. In fact, I think they lost $2 billion last year. But their stock is going through the roof. So you have that at play. And then the, the, the real players that have come into the marketplace and, and are going to be, I think, even more uh, viable and more kind of like impactful to our business is, is Amazon, is Facebook, <clears throat> is Google. Uh, and is Apple. And those people, the, the economics that they make around any one piece of content is dramatically different. You know, a, a user on Amazon Prime, and if he's there and watching television shows, they monetize in so, much, so many different ways. And the, the value of having someone on your platform or Apple having you embedded in their, in their ecosystem so you buy their phones and their tablets, the content is a, has a completely different value proposition. So that's where the media companies who traditionally looked at this, and as you talked about Disney, you know, they are, you know, and presuming they, they get Fox or Comcast as, at the end of the day, the next thing they do is there, they go great, create great content, but they have, they're still in a system where they're, they're, their investors look at them to be profitable quarter to quarter, and they're going to be competing against people who in this one area, they may not have to have the same financial pressures. So that is why you're seeing all this talk and why they're trying to beef up and, and get bigger is because they're going to need that to compete against these platforms. So it creates a very fascinating time. But I would say in the near future, I don't see a slowdown in the amount of money spent on content for all those kind of varying reasons. So the way you describe it, it sounds like, I mean, as they used to say, content is king. Does it really shift the bargaining relationship uh, with the, the talent and the supplier on the one hand and the acquirer on the other? Because it sounds like it's a lot easier negotiation than it was when you had a handful of broadcast networks and a handful of cable networks. And really, they, they could really grind the prices on you. It sounds like you have much more power. We do. I mean, we do by, by virtue of the change in the system and the more choices and the amount of money and competition for it. And really, we sit at the furthest point upstream mm -hmm. with this. So like. No matter all the companies you talk about, you're calling me or someone like me to access that content to create those shows. And so with more competition, uh, there are a lot more choices. But again, the biggest thing that we have to do is it's not just about who will pay the most. We have to figure out, OK, where is this place going to sit? Is it going to get promoted the way that the creators want it to be promoted? Are people going to see it? 
is it a right match? And I think that's, it's not just about who's going to pay us the highest money. It's about where we're going to have the most success. Because again, back to what I was saying earlier, you know, these are creative people and the content they're creating is not just about a mercenary financial transaction. It's like, where can I have the most impact? And they want it seen and they want it consumed and they want it talked about. Uh, so it's a balance of that, which actually makes the job super interesting. But everything that we've done and grow, it actually is what it, it kind of drives what we do going forward to kind of grow our business. Everything's kind of based upon the clients or the things that we own or represent, and how do we build more resources for them to take advantage of? Tell us about the future of Endeavor. I mean, you've grown really fast, as you pointed out. Uh, are you going to keep growing at that pace? Is there a leveling off period? Is there a natural scale that you get to that you say, you know, it doesn't help to grow that much more? I don't think, uh, we don't look at those terms. I think we've had a lot of uh, growth in, in a very short period of time, Just, but that was because there was really right opportunities that were in front of us uh, that we couldn't pass up. And, uh, you know, so a after doing IMG, you know, the UFC we had represented for a decade. So we knew that sport incredibly well. One of the great things about the representation business is that you see trends and you see things really early. And so by representing the UFC when it was a nascent sport, we saw how explosive it was, how fast it was growing. We understood it. And, uh, and again, we were uh, advising them and representing them in their uh, domestic TV deals. So we got to know it really well. And so when it came time that they just happened, the Fertitta brothers decided they were willing, willing to sell it, we thought we would uniquely know how to like grow that asset. And so that lot of us was being opportunistic. It was like we couldn't pass that up. And uh, I think our growth will be kind of based upon things like that, where there's, if there's other things out there like the UFC or PBR where based upon what we do across Endeavor, we can uniquely grow it faster or we think better than anyone else. Or there's other things that are in our core businesses that we're currently in. They either create new geographies or new verticals for them. That, those two things will kind of drive our, our kind of M&A strategy, I think. Uh, and so if there's a ton of opportunity, we'll continue to grow pretty at rapid speed. Or, but we, we have no set goal of getting to a certain size. We, we feel we've got the scale and, uh, and reach that we need. And we think we've got our network effect down, that we got all the pieces across Endeavor working together, so we've got the machine right. So now it's just, okay, what, 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 what else makes sense? Uh, buying something like UFC makes sense if it's worth, those assets are worth more in your hands than in the, the owner's That's hands right. as a practical matter. You can do things with them that maybe others couldn't do. Are there other leagues, I'm not talking about the NFL necessarily, the NBA or something, but are other leagues, organizations like that, that that same logic might apply, whether in the United States or worldwide? Uh, well, certainly, I mean, I think you're gonna see, I mean, the, what was unique about the UFC was there's other MMA you know, sports out there in, in competitive leagues, but UFC really is kind of like the sport. It's the primary. And so we saw it was, it's very hard to you know, kind of be able to own a sport in a, in a way that, that the UFC is, has in this unique, unique situation. But I think you're going to see sports, all the kind of like A-level sports properties, whether it's the ownership of the teams or the leagues, or the rights to them. That's one of the things I think is fascinating about the world now and the explosion of OTT is that niche rights, so our streaming rights around you know, Australian rugby, okay? There could be tons of expats in the United States, so that yeah. those streaming rights for people in the United States of America to subscribe and get that a league pass, if you will, is now available. And so I think the monetization of rights are gonna grow. And then the big thing that obviously everybody's now talking about is if, you know, is gambling, it gets you know approved across the United States. That is going to be a boon for all of the kind of like sports leagues, uh, kind of around the globe. But you're seeing rights everywhere. You, know, you saw the PGA make the deal with Discovery, yeah. which is I think going to be a, a very successful for both of them. Uh, and that's a little bit of what I'm talking about here. So I think uh, you know sports. I think is you know as domestic viewership maybe decline in certain areas. They're talking about. I still think the long term. Uh, perspective for the, the AAA tier sports is, is really great. Uh, so, so finally, how do you measure success? I mean, <laughs> when you go in the office every day, uh, what does your report card look like? What does your dashboard look like? And is it similar to another business or is it different? Wow, that's a great question. Um, you know, I don't know. I think, uh, you know, there's always a part of you that when you started out as an agent, it's a little bit like the people you represent or the people you lead, I think are the kinds of things that you're, you first start with. And so 
that's pretty easy to kind of see, are you moving the needle along for them and are the people underneath you growing? Uh, so I think that's uh, probably the first thing. I, I guess I, I always kind of look at uh, our trajectory in like three year cycles, mm -hmm. like what are we gonna try to accomplish in the next three years? So I kind of, you know, we have that kind of hit list of what they are and then you kind of look at that at the end of the three years. But uh, the, 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 what's great about the job, um, but also the challenge of it is that, is that the rapidity of every day mm -hmm. and the, the pace at which you're going, you don't really get a chance to stop and think too much about, <laughs> about that. You're just trying to, uh, it becomes self-evident. You either get fired or, uh, or um, you know, it, it's pretty, it's pretty, our results are pretty tangible.